by my watch, we are at the top of the hour, so we will go ahead and get started with this month's roundtable. Thank you very much for joining us all here. We're excited for the topics that we have to present tonight. It's going to be an awesome roundtable. We have a lot of material to get through, so we're going to go pretty fast. So buckle up. Uh, we're going to have a good evening tonight. Um, tonight is all about outdoor ethics games and activities for summer camps and day camps. Um, so before we begin, just a couple matters of housekeeping. Number one, um, if you are a youth participant here tonight, please make sure to turn your camera off so we can record it. This is for youth protection purposes. Um, also, uh, as you join and as you come on, please make sure to mute yourself. Um, unless you're presenting, we would like everyone to be muted. Uh, that way we don't have any background noise coming in um, and, and making it difficult for people to understand. Uh, as usual, please also introduce yourself with your name and your council in the chat. We like to see who we have here with us tonight. Um, and with that said, we will go ahead and go on to the next slide. Okay, so tonight um, we're going to have our safety moment by Michelle coming up in a few seconds. We're going to do uh, also the, the Pledge of Allegiance, Oath and Law. Um, then we have a presentation on outdoor ethics activities on the go. Um, games and activities uh, that you can use for outdoor ethics, uh, programs at camp, um, games and activities for specific events, uh, and then how to have an outdoor ethics camp reprogram. Afterwards, we'll have a few short announcements and then a session for question and answers, and we will try to be out of here by 8.30 central time, so about an hour and a half total for tonight. Um, as we go along, we understand you may have questions. Please make sure if you do have a question to put it into the chat, we will be monitoring that so we can answer them as they come. Um, and that way we'll be able to gather up all the questions and answer those in the Q&A section. All right, that being said, uh, please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, make sure that you're muted as well, uh, but we will go ahead and do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Two. And the Scout Oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the Scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake and morally straight. And the law. A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. And the outdoor code. As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, be careful with fire, be considered in the outdoors, and be conservation minded too. All right. Um, as always, we have our post uh, roundtable survey that we have. We will also put this link in the chat. Um, you can scan this with your QR. Uh, this helps us to know uh, things we can improve on, perhaps topics that you'd like to, to see for next time. Um, and it just helps us stay connected with you and, and keep making these roundtables better. Um, the material that we're covering is stuff that we've gotten directly off of these surveys. So if you would give us your input after the uh, round table is completed, that would be awesome. We'll remind you again of, to take that survey at the end of the round table. Thank you. All right, um, we've already said that. Please continue to introduce yourselves. Thank you to those that are doing so. And we will turn it over to Michelle for our safety moment. Right, so with uh, spring just around the corner for almost everybody, it's time to think about those poisonous plants that are starting to come to life. Uh, next slide. So leave what you find and hike on durable surfaces. If we can follow those two things, we should be able to stay safe. But the three that we, of course, most want to watch out for is the poison ivy, the poison oak, and the poison sumac. Uh, depending on where you live in the country, some may be more prevalent than others. Uh, poison ivy probably found just about everywhere except Alaska, Hawaii, and parts of the West Coast. Oak looks like an oak. So lots of people try to pick it up only to be um, surprised that it is not. And of course, poison sumac growing as a tall shrub or small tree in the bogs and swamps. Next slide. Despite training to identify them on site and efforts to avoid them, we've all stumbled through either chasing each other, chasing the dog, or just not watching where we're walking. Um, and of course it can cause that uncomfortable itch 
itch, a rash, or perhaps even blisters, depending on your sensitivity. Um, it is the aerosol oils in those three plants that is the principal cause of the rash. The majority of people are considered allergic, a few seriously allergic. Um, everybody has some sort of a reaction to it. It's an oil. So think about how oil does not leave your skin. It's water resistant, um, which is why just rinsing it off is not going to work. Uh, but some people's skin is more reactive than others. Um, and so that 85% are considered um, allergic. You're going to get some sort of a rash, the itching. Um, severely allergic is going to cause those blisters. Um, avoidance is the best action. And if we are leaving what we find and we are walking on durable surfaces, the poison, those, those three plants will not grow on the durable surface. They prefer being a little bit of, of recover. Um, take a look where you camp or picnic. Be sure to point out the plants who are to those that are not familiar with them, especially our younger scouts. Um, and if you've walked through, try to avoid contact with your shoes and pants. Uh, your shoe, the bottoms of your shoes can carry that oil. And then when you go to take it off, now you've got it on your hands or on your leg or on your buddy's sleeping bag. Um, don't use wood with hairy vines attached in campfires because smoke from the plants can spread the oil and even create a rash in their airways or in your eyes. Next slide. If you think you've been exposed, you have a limited time to wash off the aerosol before it affects you. Um, use soap or water, especially designed products like Xanfil Ivy Wash or Technu. I'm very familiar with the Xanfil and the Ivy Wash. Those two work spectacularly, especially for those with high allergy counts. Um, and it's been formulated to remove the aerosol within a few hours of exposure. Um, signs and symptoms to watch out for redness, inching, swelling, blisters, difficulty breathing if you've inhaled some of that. Um, it often appears in a straight line because of the way the plant brushes against your skin. But if you develop the rash after touching a piece of clothing, clothing or your pet fur or the bottoms of your boots, um, it can develop in an odd shape. And it usually develops 12 to 48 hours after exposure and can last two to three weeks. If you get someone who is highly allergic, a visit to the doctor's office is best because there, there are medicated um, creams and stuff that can, can alleviate that rash. Next slide. Oh, that was the end of me. For that is your safety moment. All right, we will go ahead and turn it over to Paula Church from Longhorn Council for our first presentation. Okay, so you've taken a Lemno Trace trainer course or a master educator course, and then a little while later you get a call from a unit say, hey, come teach us Lemno Trace. So what do you do? So one of the things that is a really handy thing to do is create yourself a toolkit. So that when you get those calls, you just gra grab your toolkit and you're ready to go. So uh, some of the things that we do in our council, we have what's called a Bigfoot bucket. We talked about that back in October in our Cub Scout uh, roundtable. And in this bucket, we've got activities and games uh, that uh, districts can ch uh, check out uh, to do for Cub Scout day camp. And our Bigfoot's backpack is for summer camp with activities for Scouts BSA aged um, scouters. And uh, we can uh, go in and train our summer camp staff and then they have all the games and activities they need that they can pull out to use for summer camp. So uh, these are a little bit fancy. My friend Shandra Clark uh, uh, created these with her cricket machine, but you don't have to do anything fancy. All, this is just a Lowe's bucket and about a $10 backpack that I ordered online somewhere. And um, you can also use baggies. Baggies work great. Uh, these are different activities that I have in a baggie. And I just uh, write the name on the uh, baggie and those are good to go. I can throw that in a pack and uh, uh, take off and uh, go do, a, do an activity with the unit. Now, if you're not into making things yourself, they're uh, from the Leave No Trace, lmt.org. Uh, they have a peak notebook that you can order yourself and um, it contains uh, these peak activities and each of the activities comes in a packet and there are cards and anything you need for that activity is in that packet. 
and there's some other um, resources from Leave No Trace. Uh, the Bigfoot's Playbook, I believe that'll be talked about several times tonight, but uh, you could throw that in a gallon size baggie and then print off all the cards. And I've got this uh, down here below. I've got the uh, link to the PDF that has all the cards and the resources for that playbook. And you could print those off, cut them out, put them in uh, smaller baggies and put all of that in one big baggie. And you've got an excellent resource kit that you can take uh, anywhere and uh, use on the trail, use at uh, meetings, where, wherever you need. Uh, the Leave No Trace 101 book is very similar. Uh, it has a lot of the same activities, but there are 101 activities in there. Uh, it does not have the resources with it. So you would have to create your own resources with that. Uh, also from lnt.org, you could purchase the uh, Leave No Trace or Teaching Leave No Trace book, but that is also available on uh, scouting.org. And I've got the link for that right here. And it walks through uh, each of the principles and gives you uh, content and um, activities that you can do as well. And this one's free. And that's it. This is just a, a picture of what's in the bucket. Next slide. All right, and that's me. So, hi everybody. I'm Maria Brown from Southern Sierra Council. There's quite a few California scouters in the call. Hi everybody. So I'm located about 100 miles north of Los Angeles. Um, I put my email on the address on the slide because you may want to know my email a little bit later in this presentation. So let's start with an activity. I need everyone please to get a piece of paper and we are going to draw this beautiful Joshua tree, which is found all over California's deserts. Uh, the theme for Cub Scout Day Camp this year is wild, wild west. So I need you to draw this tree um, as best as you can in the next 30 seconds, you know, doodle the tree really quickly, leaving room around the margins of the tree that you are drawing for some activities. So just put the tree in the middle. So I love Joshua trees. They are a true harbinger of uh, climate change. So they're a great tree to pay attention to. It really lets you know how well your environment is doing. All right, so everybody should have doodled really quickly. We're not professional artists, or at least I'm not. So should have doodled really quickly this Joshua tree. So at the top, I would like for you to write all the things you notice about this Joshua tree. Just one or two words. What do you notice about the tree? I notice it's much taller than the things that are around it. It's a tall tree. I notice that it has fuzz all over it. It looks like um, uh, leaves that maybe over time have laid down. I notice that it's in the desert. It's a very dry climate. What do you notice about this tree? So you should be writing quick, quick little notes, what you notice about this Joshua tree. All right, you should have at least two or three things that you have written down that you've observed about this tree. So we're gonna move on to the next talking point. I wonder, is there anything that you wonder about this Joshua tree? I know I wonder how long Joshua trees live and how they survive in a really dry and arid climate. I wonder, do any birds make their nests in this tree? Or maybe some insects? I wonder, does it make blooms? What do we wonder about this tree? So you should have very quickly jotted a couple of notes about the Joshua tree and things that you wonder about it. And we're gonna move on to the last question. It reminds me, what does this Joshua tree remind you of? 
I don't know about you guys, but that's a very muscular tree. It looks like it's got muscles on its branches. It reminds me of the scrub brushes I use to clean around the house or to wash my dishes. What does it remind you of? You should have written a couple of things. And congratulations, you just did a nature journaling activity. Yay, round of applause. So nature journaling is a really great way to front load our scouts with uh, observations that they can make later. A lot of times when you ask a young person a question, they get a little frozen and they don't have anything to say because they have to think, they have to think about it for a second. Now we did a really quick, super fast nature journaling activity. We would take a lot more time if this was something we were doing in, in real life. Definitely you wanna allow your scouts at least 15 minutes to work through all of the possible observations and iterations of what it is that they wanna say. And this activity comes from John Muir Laws. I am a huge proponent of nature journaling. He wrote this wonderful book that you can actually go to his website and download for free as a PDF. And this book offers lots and lots of different ways to teach activities. He also has a very robust YouTube channel that has a, uh, a playlist that is called the Nature Journal Connection Playlist. And this playlist offers 10 minute instructional components on how to teach different aspects of nature journaling. And so why nature journaling combined with outdoor ethics? Because outdoor ethics is all about the heart. It's all about loving and being willing to protect nature and being willing to protect our environment. And nature journaling is a great way to get our scouts to stop, think, observe, and then when they need to, present to others about what it is that they love and why outdoor ethics is so important to them. All right, so now we're gonna move on to the next slide. So there's a lot of stuff on this. I'm not gonna read it all. Um, you'll all be able to get this later. But I did really want to show how it is that outdoor ethics appears all over the Cub Scout Trail. We know that it appears in the Scouts BSA Trail, the first class requirements, but it also appears throughout the Cub Scout Trail in a very connected and scaffolded sort of way. For example, the lions don't have any explicit outdoor language, but their mountain lion adventure incorporates planning ahead and preparing and respecting wildlife. The tigers have to hear the outdoor code and they have to hear the leave no trace principles for kids. This is a really great place because it requires them to explain why we trash our trash to go to the Bigfoot's playbook that's already been mentioned and pull out that activity, that trash your trash relay and boom, you have an activity that gets them to physically learn why it is important to trash your trash. Moving on to wolves, their paws on path asks them to explain why it's important to practice leave no trace and why the outdoor code is important. This is a great place to do a nature journaling activity because once again, it gives them an opportunity to stop and think and then they have something to say. So their necessities doesn't have any explicit outdoor ethics language, but requirements to talk about planning ahead and preparing. And Selecting a campsite on the correct surface. Weeblows and Arrow of Lights, they're becoming members of Scouts BSA in the very near future. So there are very specific requirements for them around the outdoor code and leave no trace. And so this is a really great way to incorporate some of the activities that you've already seen on the previous slide and that nature journaling activity. Now you can do things like having them nature journal and then create a gallery. So we know that when you go to a gallery, there's things hanging up on the walls and people walk around. It's the same concept for a gallery walk. You have, you assign each of the scouts a topic and they create something that reflects that topic. And then you display that artwork and you have the scouts walk from poster to poster and observe what those posters say. We know peer-to-peer -peer education is super effective. And this is a really great way to make it on their feet, moving around. We know our kids are kinesthetic learners. They've got to be moving around. And a gallery walk 
brings all of our worlds together in a really perfect kind of way. So let's talk about the outdoor code. This was supposed to be a video call. Can you play the video? As an American, I will do my best to be clean in my outdoor manners, to be careful with fire, to be considerate in the outdoors, and to be conservation minded. All right, so there you saw an example of how we can use hand signs to teach different concepts. We've, you've probably seen the hand signs for the seven principles of Leave No Trace, and I am not embarrassed to admit that I could not remember the seven principles in order until I learned the hand signs for the seven principles for Leave No Trace. But I was really impressed when I discovered that adult leaders had come up with hand signs to teach the outdoor code. We know there's four C's in the outdoor code. How do we remember them in order? Hand signs. This is a really great way to teach our youngest scouters the, the outdoor code by giving them an easy way to remember what order those four C's appear in. And so the, the written description of what you just watched has been uploaded into the resources for tonight's session. If you would like to see that written out as a written resource. Oops. So let's talk about campfire. Campfire is a really great place to talk about outdoor ethics. So this particular outdoor ethics song was actually written during the Crossroads of the West Master Educator course this last August. It was super fun. You can see Matt right there. Um, and then next to Matt, the first lady you see sitting next to Matt, that is Angie. Angie wrote this song on our course. And the great thing about it was she used music everybody already knows. If you're happy and you know it, I don't have to teach anything musically to my scouts. They know the music already. So we're already excited. And then the words are tons of fun. It's a cute little three verse song. We just used this at our most recent IOLS in our demonstration campfire. And the leaders were super excited and they loved it. It's just a really fun, happy little song that you can add to your campfire. This is another song that I found from Troop 376 in Milwaukee, Oregon. And once again, the music is not a mystery. It's music we all recognize, row, row, row your boat. The only thing I did was I reorganized the verses so that they are in order of leave no trace, the seven principles. But as I was doing that, I realized something. There's seven verses, but there's only six principles represented. One principle is missing. And once again, these songs are uploaded to the resources for this evening session. But it did make me think, huh, this is another great, great way to really encourage outdoor ethics. Let's have a contest. So my good friend, Jack Chicken, who is also on that great master educator course in August, he loves 3D printing and he created these awesome slides that are super cool prizes to give away to our ethic, to ethics guides in our, in our areas. So here's the contest. Pay attention to the rules. The deadline for the submission of a verse to complete the song is April the 30th, that's two weeks and a couple extra days from now. And the winner for the three slides you see in the picture being made by Jack right now will be announced on May the 11th. So how do you get your submission in? You get it into the email address on your screen. You submit your submission and you can do it by yourself or with your favorite team of people. And you get that submission turned into me. And then I will find a panel of judges who will pick the winner to be announced on May the 11th at the next round table. Another thing that I have created myself, I love to use Django blocks, I think. And you'll see Django blocks again this tonight because they're super useful. Um, I love to do consequence games. And in this particular case, I made a game in where two thirds of the blocks are painted green on the ends. Those blocks represent plants, 
and animals. And then the remaining 18 blocks are brown. They're left brown because they represent people. And I created a set of consequence cards. All of those, cons all of those cards have a consequence. For example, congratulations, your family did a great job washing their dinner dishes during an overnight camping trip. Oh, but they didn't strain the wastewater before broadcasting it over a broad area. The tiny pieces of food waste in the water attracted animals. Remove one green block. And you keep doing that over and over again until your tower collapses. Now, the cool thing about this is when you debrief the scouts, they really get the message that people, those brown blocks, they depend on those green blocks beneath them. And when you remove too many of those green blocks, it can undermine the health and safety of all of the people. And so it's kind of a really cool way to teach scouts. This is a great activity you can have as a gathering activity, sitting on a table or maybe out at lunchtime for the scouts to play with, or even as part of a problem solving round robin, which is another great place to incorporate activities from Bigfoot's playbook. And then I have one more video to show you. We're going to show you how to uh, a skit that might possibly you might be able to incorporate into a campfire. So, Paul, if you could, let's see if it'll play with the video or with Whoa. the sound. Oh man! Look at this, Lieutenant. Oh, this is incredible. Woo. CSI coming through. Oh wait, 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 wait! I've seen some real messes, but oh man, yeah, this is yeah. brutal. Uh, look oh, at this, this place. Is one nasty campfire. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, this one is uh intense. Oh. <laughs> All, right. All right, everybody, stand back, stand back. We need some room here. What's going on? Hey, we're Camp Giuseppo CSI. That's right. Camp Site Investigation. I'm Lieutenant Jack Red. And this is Detective Calrico. My name is not a clever pun like his. Yeah, yeah I noticed that. <laughs> I mean, like, you're a flying squirrel. You should have, like, some cute, fancy name. Well, why wouldn't you? Okay, I didn't want to play the whole um, presentation. It's three minutes. And this was a practice that we were doing for our Wood Badge course that we ran last fall. Uh, this is a great way to incorporate outdoor ethics in a fun and entertaining sort of way. You probably like very vaguely heard that when he said that was intense and he put on his sunglasses, you heard the who screaming in the back because that was supposed to be like the CSI show on television. So maybe our kids might not recognize that show as much as we do, but this was a great way of showing how, um, how it is that we incorporate contemporary media in a relatable sort of way. And yes, dad jokes are a requirement for any skit. Thank you. <laughs> Anyhow, the whole point of it is, especially when adults become involved and they go over the top and they're very ridiculous. This is a great way for the scouts to become um, open to being educated and open to learning something new. So skits about outdoor ethics are great in Cub Scout day camp and they're great in Scouts BSA summer camp. So this is one of those activities that can really be very impactful both ways. And so that concludes my part of the presentation. Like I said, tons of stuff. Everything that had a printed resource was uploaded. So the Jenga game and the challenge cards, all of that was uploaded. The songs were uploaded, hand motions were uploaded. Uh, anything that I talked about as a reference, I, I, I sent it in to be uploaded to the resources for this. And thank you so much. All right, next presenter. All right, that would be me. So um, I was asked to talk specifically about incorporating outdoor ethics activities and programs at summer camp, um, and particularly for first year campers. Um, so I've had the, the good fortune to be a camp director for four years. Uh, three of those years was over our new scout camp, um, Camp Tracy, just right here above Salt Lake City. 
And then the last year I was the camp director for uh, a scout reservation called Hinkley Scout Reservation. But uh, we brought the program that we had at Camp Tracy and incorporated it into what we were running at Hinkley um, and created a new scout program for them. And so uh, we weren't focused on any merit badges or anything at Camp Tracy or in that new scout program, but we were focused on the trail to first class. And as part of that, uh, as, as we all know, there are, is a heavy dose of outdoor ethics requirements. Um, leave no trace and tread lightly and whatnot. And so we attempted to incorporate that very heavily into our program. Now, my approach it, with, with teaching outdoor ethics and with incorporating it into a program is not so much, at, at least the end result is I, I desire to not have it be like, oh, we're going to leave no trace class or we're going to outdoor ethics class where we will learn all the outdoor ethics. My goal is to have it be incorporated into the program at a level where it's just what we do. Um, if you come to camp, you're going to be practicing leave no trace as a result of coming to camp. Um, and so, you know, over the progression of several years, we had this put into our, we had it in our leader's guide. We had it at all the activities. There was some kind of outdoor ethics component to every single one of the activities and requirements and stations that we had at our camp, regardless of what it was. So, uh, you know, for example, even at our shooting sports, at our archery and, and our rifle range, um, Tread Lightly has materials about shooting sports, and we had those inf that information posted there and a little bit of a discussion and application of how um, Tread Lightly and outdoor ethics are important in the shooting sports world, because um, that's not necessarily a connection that we often make. And so it was, it was uh, at the level of this is everything we do. We try, we, we put, we brought in recycle bins around the camp. We started to talk about you know, being more sustainable in the activities that we had. Now, we did have some specific outdoor ethics games and, and activities um, because we had uh, an, an interesting, I'll, I'll show you in a second, we had an interesting partnership that we were doing as well. And one of our requirements in particular uh, was very outdoor ethics oriented. So um, the first thing that I wanna bring up, and this will probably, it's already been brought up and it'll probably be brought up again, um, if you're looking for great outdoor ethics activities to incorporate into your program, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. Now, obviously, we have some very creative people here uh, who have created their own activities and, and their own skits and their own songs and things like that. But we have a vast um, resource full of activities that are ready made that tell you how, where you can get the materials. In fact, for the Bigfoot's playbook that you see on the screen, um, you can go to lnt.org and download all of the materials that they have that go with this, the, the specific activities in that book. Um, and that's what I've done. I've just downloaded all of them, uh, printed them out, laminated them so that I can use them over and over and over again. Now, the nice thing is, is you know, once you've got this baseline of activities, this foundation of activities that you have in your toolbox, in your grab bag, you can uh, adapt it to your own specific circumstances and your own needs. Then you can build on that and be creative with what you have. So don't feel like you have to build activities and come up with activities from the ground up. Um, use these resources as your foundation. And once you've got that foundation built, then it's really super easy to adapt and tweak these activities to be used in whatever program, whatever context you have, uh, whether it's at a merit badge or a, a trainer course or a, a new scout course uh, or a new scout program at a scout camp. And they're very, very easy to incorporate into everything. So <clears throat> the other thing that I wanna talk about here is using the resources that are around you, meaning the people and the, the partnerships and the things that, that you have at your disposal. So here in Northern Utah, in Crossroads of the West Council, we have uh, a couple really great resources and a couple really awesome things. Pretty much all of our camps are surrounded by or bordering um, national forest land, the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest. Um, some of them are even surrounded by designated wilderness areas. Um, and while I was a, the director for um, uh, Camp Tracy, uh, there was a program 
be that was created by a, a gentleman who we have on the call tonight, Dave Hatch. We got to give him credit for this. This is his his child. Um, where you could, if you went to a wilderness area and visited one of the wilderness areas that we have here in Utah um, and practiced Leave No Trace uh, and wrote to the Forest Service about what wilderness means to you and how you practice and prepared to, to, do, to practice Leave No Trace, you could earn a patch set, um, which is, yeah, right here. So it's kind of cut off, but you can see it. We've got nine different wilderness areas. So it made a really cool circular patch set like this with the main patch that you could earn by learning about the principles of Leave No Trace. Um, and so Dave Hatch uh, is obviously a scouter, but uh, he's all, he was also uh, employed with the Forest Service at that time. Um, and so we partnered with the Forest Service to offer this program at our camp as part of our five mile hike. So um, in the requirements, I believe it's a second class requirement. One of them is, to, is required to go on a five mile hike using a map and a compass. And if you're going to go on a five mile hike, you might as well practice leave no trace too. And so the, we had an outdoor ethics um, session that we had that was full of games and whatnot, where we had the kids earn this central patch. And then as part two of that, the next morning, they went on their five mile hike in our wilderness area that is, is directly adjacent to Camp Tracy, the Mount Olympus wilderness. Um, where they got to earn the Mount Olympus segment of this patch set. Now, this patch set was, it was kind of designed with scouts in mind, but it was open to the general public as well. So they could go home and do this with their families or, or with their troops or, or whatnot. So we introduced them to this, and this helped us to address a lot of issues that we were, that, that scouts were having in wilderness areas in, in Utah, um, especially with Leave No Trace issues. And so we used the activities that were in those books that you saw to help teach the principles of Leave No Trace. And then at the end of this, the thing that they always love, first, they got a patch. Everybody loves a patch. And um, not only is it part of a set, but it did have a little dangle so they could hang it on their uniform, which is really cool. Both the, the youth and the adults could earn this. Um, but then they got to go on a cool hike in a designated wilderness and learn a little bit about that wilderness area and why it's so special why designated wildernesses are important and why Leave No Trace helps to preserve that wilderness experience. Um, and when, when I first met with Dave and talked about this, um, he was like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. You know, here's a handful of patches. We'll see what happened. Um, and in the first week of running this course, we, we ran through every single one of those patches. It was, it was a huge hit. And I called Dave up and I was like, Dave, we're out of patches. How many more you got? And he's like, well, I got like 60 more. How many do you need? And I'm like, 400 maybe. <laughs> so we scrambled to get them together. Um, but we ran this program for, for like three years um, and ran, you know, four, four to 600 kids through this every summer. Um, and so they all got this patch, the part of the patch set. A lot of them went on to continue to practice Leave No Trace and, and go into the wilderness areas. Um, and um, they all got a hang tag, they all got Leave No Trace materials, uh, and we started to see a lot of shift in both the youth and adults in their knowledge of Leave No Trace and in the ways they prepared for the outdoors, because this is their first year camping. This is, you know, trail to first class, first year scout camp, and why not at the very, very beginning, because again, as scouts, outdoor ethics is just what we do. Let's give them that dose and say, if you're going to be a scout, you're going to practice Leave No Trace. You're going to do some awesome activities like this. And so you need to be prepared for that. Um, so, oh, why is it not moving? I'm trying to change slides and it's not letting me. Oh, there we go. Ah, no, no, no. Sorry. So I went on to another camp after this to Hinkley Scout Ranch, which was a full, you know, week-long scout camp with all of the programs there. Um, but we still wanted to have a solid first year camper program. And so what we came up with uh, at this camp was something called the Bigfoot Boot Camp, uh, which was uh, kind of similar to what we had done there, but with more of the, you know, directly taking stuff out of the Bigfoot playbook. And so I designed a, an obstacle course 
where if you're going to get through the obstacles, you're going to have to leave no trace. You're going to have to act like a Bigfoot. Um, and so in order to get through this, there were several obstacles and each obstacle had to do with one of the principles of leave no trace and a, an activity that was taken out of the Bigfoot playbook and then adapted um, somewhat by me to the specific circumstance. Um, so everyone kind of liked the idea of, you know, being like the ninja or the Bigfoot and having to get through nature with, without, you know, causing disturbances and whatnot. So we started off with the activity Web of Life uh, which probably a lot of you have seen. It comes out of the, it's in the 101 book. It's also, I believe it's also in Bigfoot's playbook, um, but it kind of shows the connections in nature and how important it is to essentially tiptoe through those without disturbing those connections as much as possible. And that set the scene for, okay, now we've, we've understand why it's important to avoid those connections and avoid disturbing these things in nature. Now let's see if we can actually do it. Um, and so we went through these different activities here with um, specific is superior, which is an activity uh, in, in, in the Bigfoot's playbook. And each one of them had to do with each of the seven principles of, of leave no trace. Um, and so by the end of that, they could earn their patch. They could earn their, their Bigfoot certified um, hang tag. Uh, and just they had a great time. So we've got a couple of pictures here of people having this activity here. Um, I've got to move on. We also had the Forest Service again helping us out. We stayed connected to them and they, they sent one of their personnel over to help us out. Um, but uh, I, I've, we've got to move on to the next slideshow. If you want more information about this as well, you're welcome to contact me. Um, but everything that we used was directly out of the Bigfoot's playbook. All right, on to Don. Oh, good evening, thanks, Matt. So we're gonna talk about some games and activities that split it up a little bit. Uh, first of all, games and activities are fun, lectures are boring, and uh, you need some seat time breakup with uh, running some games. I've been running Leave No Trace courses, uh, trainer courses for about 12 years now, and our critiques come back and we finally, uh, over the years, it's tweaked it to having a, an activity prior to every lecture. So uh, we try to get everybody up and out and around, either outside or somewhere in the building if we're inside. So you've already seen all of these. We have the 101 book, playbook, the, the educator book, and the peak pack information. So it's kind of like we hit you with a two by four in the beginning and repeated hits kind of helps drive it home. But some of the other resources I've used is the dudes. I haven't heard them mentioned yet tonight. The Leave No Trace dudes have some good stuff. And for those of you in the West, you may remember Don Gale. Don Gale at one time had a, um, a website called Roar, which is no longer supported, so it's been gone for a while. But I was fortunate enough to download a lot of active, a lot of his information. I know Paula Booth has some. I know Charlie Thorpe has some. And then on YouTube, there's there's a variety of things both put on by Leave No Trace Org and, uh, and other people uh, for resources. So in a trainer course, like I say, we try to break this up so that we have an activity before every game, every uh, of the principles that we discuss. And then after the course is over, I send out a list and where to find it or the details on how I ran whatever game or activity and this is a, a typical sheet that sends out is sent out, and this is also in the in the information on the resources I sent in. Well, what I want to talk about is we have a, a day camp coming up or a weekend camp. Um, I'm just west of Milwaukee, so you know what Milwaukee is with the Brewers. We have opening day, and that's the name of our campery. So there's three segments to this. We get about 500 kids in camp. Uh, one is a troop shoot, the other is a merit badge, sessions that the uh, middle scouts can go to, and then we have quick start. So this is all kids that have just transitioned into Scouts USA uh, from Weeblos, and it's a limited group to, to 80 youth. They break them into um, patrols of 10 for the rotations. Um, so... The other trainers and I, we get two hours 
and we get 40 of the kids per um, per hour. And what we do is uh, put two of the patrols together and they get about 20 minutes worth of lecture on the outdoor code and we give them a hang tag and we walk through the uh, principles or as I like to call them the guidelines of on the brown tag. And uh, the other two patrols are broken up. So there's a group of 10 and a group of 10 and we run an activity. And then after 10 minutes, they switch. After a total of 20 minutes, then the group that's being this talk to moves out and does the games and the other kids come in. So it's a lot of logistics and moving things. And what I try to do is we have these things that are somewhat quick, but somewhat keep their attention for the maybe 10 minutes that you have them after they've wandered out and you can get them settled down. Um, the, I have a big poster that I um, got a number of years ago. And in the I think it's Bigfoot's, Bigfoot's playbook, and it's probably mentioned some other places, really came from Don Gale years ago, uh, where he had a great big beach ball that he wrote on lots of questions, and you threw this big beach ball around, and I didn't want a big beach ball that would be wearing off magic marker on people's hands. I came up, we came up with this little ball, that's about an eight to ten inch ball, um, sitting down here somewhere on my floor, but uh, you throw it around uh, four or five times when it's you yell stop. The youth that has it says, gives you the number that's by his right thumb, and he gets to pick one of the principles. And then you have a, the book you see on the the bottom there. Um, you read a question, and there can really be no wrong answers. It could be a right answer. But the wrong answers are almost better because then you can have a little discussion and you can go on. So it's an easy game for 10 minutes. Another one we sometimes use is the garbage game. And instead of passing out packets of different materials and having kids stand in line like it's described in some of the attempts uh, to keep the kids more from banging around and screwing around, uh, we have buckets of the different ones and you hold it up and only answer or respond to the youth that has his hand up. Uh, it helps teach manners because there's always those that like to shout it out, but you can kind of keep control with the ones that uh, uh, raise their hand and, and only respect that they've done that and ask them to answer the question. Another one is the okay versus no way. Um, this is one of the ways we run it where you the presenter in the in the middle asks the question and they you have a sign that says no way and a sign that says okay uh, stuck in the ground and they step to the left or to the right and then you can always use that also as a discussion because you have uh, a, a chance for them to explain why they stepped one way or the other way and then like I say the hang hand out the uh, the brown tags we uh, during the discussion time period we just walk through those try to get them to speak in some of their experiences although they haven't had a tremendous amount yet and i also have gotten recently of putting on you can buy these luggage tags and in, in fairly large quantities and it gives them something to tell them immediately to uh, hang it up put it on their water bottle right there so they don't lose it um, Sometimes you find these within 50 feet of where you've done your little presentation because they lose them. Um, but with the tag on it, it, it helps put them on the, their backpacks that they all seem to be carrying backpacks or chairs or something uh, at these events. And that's it. The materials have been sent in. So that's available. All of the uh, stuff that was the Don Gales for that ball game is, is there along how to run those other games. Um, so whoever is next, Matt. All right, Michael. That is me. Um, this is Mike Bethel with Sequoia Council. Um, probably like many of you, um, I am uh, lucky enough to be uh, 
among the last couple of folks in our in our council that are still really involved in outdoor ethics. And uh, so I am trained in both uh, Leave No Trace uh, and also Tread Lightly um, at the trainer level and not the master level. So I get tapped a lot for some, some of these things. And this, um, uh, I understood that we were gonna be talking about games for the most part. So I tr tried to tailor this to, to games. Um, I could talk to you all day about um, how we decided to uh, include technology in this campery and how we um, design some of the events to, to include cell phones. And then we didn't communicate well with one another and we published the leader's guide and said, don't bring your cell phone. Um, thank God scouts don't listen. <laughs> so we had plenty of cell phones, but um, we had QR codes on almost everything. And uh, one of the games relied upon taking photos. So, um, so anyway, I'm, I'm primarily going to talk about games, but like I say, we could talk all day about um, other aspects of the campery, uh, things that we did. Uh, we tried really hard to uh, model the uh, World Scout Jamboree's uh, impact trail, for instance. And so we, you, we, we designed an area where you would walk around um, during um, a self-paced time. You would walk around the area and um, there were the different uh, methods of relieving yourself. So there was the exposed human waste versus the cat hole versus the high tech toilet versus, um, and each one of those signs had a little QR code that you would be able to then access and you could watch the, the leave no trace or tread lightly um, or other video associated with that. And they're all, you know, minute and a half videos or, or, or whatnot. Um, and then you would move into, we had a model kitchen set up with the scrim cloth and um, the four buckets and, you know, what went into each bucket and, um, and it was very self-paced, but again, with a video, how to set up a front country versus a back country um, kitchen, um, how uh, the different kinds of fires, uh, new, new, new ground fires, uh, uh, they were all rated with stars or the, the symbol that says, don't do this. And um, uh, so fires, and then um, how to how to how to throw a bear bag. Um, we were even able to replicate the the, the there was a really neat um, spin uh, tabletop spin thing. We made it a little bigger where you could actually it would, you would give you a question, you could try to answer it, and you'd, you'd spin it and see it. Again, very self paced, not at all in my presentation. So um, I just there's so much more that went with this. There's a there was a AV tent and all kinds of other things, but primarily just to talk about the games and much of this, uh, because I'm trained in both. Um, oh, and here's, here's the patch. It's a little washed out, but um, the, my kids love this patch um, just because it's a little unusual. Uh, not, not circular, not, not square, not diamond shaped, but foot shaped. Um, anyway, uh, so, so we had a, about 148 kids and about 129 participants. So, um, and that included organizers. Our committee was way too small and we had, we did not expect this many kids. Um, really, this was our um, second campery um, since, since, uh, since the COVID pandemic and the lockdown, but we just really did not expect this many kids. We had them come up from, uh, from several districts um, from all over the council. And they were just so pleased to be somewhere, um, you know, with people of like mind uh, with tents. And, and so they were really, really happy to be there. And um, these kids were uh, very engaged. We organized the games, the, the initial morning games. Um, and these are, not all morning games. Some of these were, were um, uh, afternoon or self-paced games, uh, but we organized the morning games to be about 20 minutes a piece. And you've heard some of the games um, that we talked about. Um, this is an outdoor ethics crossword puzzle. So we tried to, I, I heard what one of you said, maybe it was uh, Don about varying the, 
the you know the 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 type of activity what to some, something a little more cerebral versus something a little more um, active and so one of our stations was this outdoor ethics crossword puzzle which was designed really just to introduce them to some of the outdoor ethics terms well, one of our goals here was to elevate the level um, of both our youth and our adults um, of their knowledge uh, about outdoor ethics in our council. Um, we still have a lot of adults who feel very much like, and then we still have a lot of car camping, um, and they feel very much like it is an adult right to bring paper plates um, so the adults don't have to do dishes. And uh, so you see lots of paper plates, lots of plastic spoons, and if you go and look at our, uh, our uh, Camperies Leaders Guide, you'll see that we told them very clearly um, that we expect you to be the example. Um, as the adult, we expect that you're going to wash your dishes and that you're gonna use uh, you know, a non-disposable mess kit. However, um, for those of you that we catch, we will be subtracting points from your unit's uh, overall score uh, if, we, if we are to catch you to do things like that. Another thing, again, not a game, so not put here, but we did actually weigh the trash that each troop produced and then divided it by the number of, um, of folks who were camped in that, in that campsite. So we were trying to pay attention and make them pay attention to their, uh, their, their footprint. Um, ha ha, but Bigfoot has a footprint too. So here's, uh, still we're looking at the crossword puzzle. Um, decomposition game. Um, again, I think Don talked about this with his buckets. Um, this is actually not a photo of what was going on. I had to steal this from the internet because I think it was a little less active and I don't have all the pictures back from my many photographers. So I didn't have a great picture of this game that didn't just look like a bunch of scouts standing around under a pop-up. So I stole this from the internet, but you get the idea. Um, this game went over really well. Um, kids were really interested, um, and it was almost better when they when they got the answer wrong, um, so that they could really think about it. You could see their uh, minds whirring. Uh, this is a, a mound fire, and uh, we did partner with the United States Forest Service. Um, I was a little nervous when the uh, when the uh, battalion chief in charge of this. Uh, he said, we'd really like you guys to come in and demonstrate mound fires. And he said, what's a mound fire? I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. Um, and then um, he didn't show up on the morning of. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes they have other things going on. Um, I'm a Creek Fire evacuee. So I, I am okay with, with them being a little bit flaky because I know that when they are, it usually means that they're doing something really important. Um, but that left me to do mound fires. Um, this is a uh, group of, uh, actually, it's a mixed group of uh, Scouts BSA and Cub Scouts um, working on mound fires. And we talked uh, about, um, you know, the whole time we talked about uh, gathering wood and what were the three Ds of gathering wood. And um, we talked about uh, scorching the earth uh, with, the, with, with the fire and what was the purpose of the mound and uh, what would you typically use to, to build this. And then we talked about some regular scout things, like what are the three basic uh, types of fires that you would build, the log cabin versus a teepee versus a lean-to. Um, but in this event, we did not allow them to light the fire and they were extraordinarily disappointed. Um, but the reason we didn't do that is because we had a fire lighting competition in the afternoon as part of the self-paced. And so you'll see some fire lighting uh, mixed in here. Note that that's in the afternoon, not not during the morning. This each of these events were confined to about 20 minutes with about five minute break in between. Really trying to pay attention to their um, attention span um, as well as uh, to move to move them through and to keep them engaged in what in what they were doing. So we have a lot of uh, and so since since they didn't show and since I had to do this, you see a lot of this. This is one of our girl units. Um, uh, formed a patrol, and actually, there's a couple of uh, cubs here as well. Um, they they're very proud, and I think their fire is actually lit. Um, so this might be from the afternoon. Um, these guys, this picture just cracks me up. Note the Cub Scout in the back backdrop, who is so 
excited. He actually just lit this fire and the look on his face as he's kind of looking away, he's just so proud of himself and he should be. Um, and here they are, you know, around their fire with the, with the fire going. Um, and uh, so this game is, um, uh, this is based upon a, a, a uh, activity that I developed for uh, for a troop, uh, a, it was a, for a Saturday activity in order for them to get their Outdoor Ethics Awareness Award, and so uh, this is a game, and I can't I cannot quite remember whether I ripped it off from Tread Lightly or from Leave No Trace, but it is a game where um, we've laid out 200 feet of rope on the ground. Um, 200 feet being the distance that you want to be from water sources or your campsite when you're going to um, use the uh, use nature's bathroom. Um, we don't tell the kids that up front. We give them two or three um, irrigation flags that you would use for plumbing. Um, and we tell them that it's a relay and they are on their marks and then they are ready, set, and they just go, go, go. When they get to the end, they lay out the flag, they run back, they tag their, their uh, uh, a fellow patrol mate and um, this continues in a relay fashion and then when we get to the end um, we uh, you can see the irrigation flags kind of in the in the background there and we talk about um, a this is the distance uh, you've you've gone the distance a few times that you would normally need to go to in order to use the the, the bathroom outside um, and guess what? If there was one perfect spot to use the bathroom, look how many times you and your, your patrol have used it over the course of a weekend camp out. Um, the flags sort of de designating that. The kids um, really enjoyed that. This was one of probably the most popular uh, games that we played. Uh, puzzle Station, something's missing. I, I, if, you, if you try to replicate this, I warn you that every time I've done this, I always end up with an, uh, a scout with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or some some halfway uh, some halfway uh, issue. So this is a game where um, you're given a puzzle, but it doesn't have all the pieces. And the idea is that that piece represents an arrowhead or a dinosaur bone or something along those lines. And um, you can play it in a variety of ways, but in this particular game, I think we just took one or two pieces. Um, I, I uh, when I first ran this, uh, I, I had a puzzle of a cat, and um, we we I took the eyes. The eyes were in my pocket, and the and the kid says to me, he says, "Mr. Bethel, he says, um, he says, do you have do you, do you have the rest of the pieces?" And I said, um, "No, son. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, someone got here first, and I guess they took them." You know, they were, of course, in my pocket. So I, I really need to finish this puzzle. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you think it is? And he says, it's a kitty. And I said, well, how do you know? I said, don't kitties have eyes? And he said, yeah. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I don't see any eyes. He goes, well, they're on the pieces that are missing. <laughs> so well, I'm not sure it's a kitty, I, you know. So anyway, uh, we, you have those kind of conversations with them about taking things, you know, and leaving what you find. Um, and then uh, the Trail Trash memory game, this is just Kim's game, um, played with um, items that you might find on a trail. Uh, obviously, folks use it, uh, you know, as uh, throughout scouting. And uh, so the kids are used to it and they're used to playing it, but they're not used to playing it with cigarette butts and candy wrappers and bits of toilet paper and things that you might find on the, you know, old used cans, uh, uh, soda cans, that sort of thing. So, uh, so it's just trail trash uh, memory game. And I think uh, with this one, we also played, uh, you know, cause this one's a little shorter than 20 minutes. We also played um, okay versus no way, a little different than Don described it, but um, like that. Camp Ono, oh um, Maria um, did a showed us a great video, and is that right? I'm, I don't have the right bifo. Maria, thank you. Um, so she showed us a, a great video of of, of, a, of a camp Ono. Oh no. So in this case, um, uh, I took my almost eighty year old pop out, 
um, and we uh, found some downed oak trees and we pieced together some limbs that were down and um, built the, the beautiful and majestic Ono tree, um, which has, you know, some carvings on it and um, has some arrows, arrow, uh, downward arrows. Troop one was here and that sort of thing um, on it and added it to, to, the, to the campsite. Um, which uh, you can read the instructions there, but basically we, we ringed it in um, sheriff's tape. There's my tree. Um, and here is the uh, Camp Ono crime scene. And uh, we gave the kids index cards and golf pencils and told them to write down everything that was, uh, that was a crime. Um, and uh, some of the kids were really, um, they were really uh, creative and they even told me which ones were misdemeanors versus felonies. So uh, we, ha we had a great time with this. Uh, they spent, the, many of them spent their full 20 minutes. Here's some of our investigators in front of my Ono tree, um, uh, which, which had its, uh, you know, please, it's fragile, rare and fragile, do not touch, mostly because I was afraid it might fall on you. Um, but I didn't get a great picture. I don't have a great picture yet of the table, um, which had an open pizza box and a stuffed squirrel um, eating out of the pizza box and, um, and all these little bitty black ants that were lined up in a row. Um, and if you, if you can read cursive, which I, a lot of them can't, they were like, what are the ants trying to spell out here? Um, the ants spelled out Bigfoot lives. So, which sort of brings us into a, um, and here they are, uh, some of these kids gathering to, to discuss, you know, uh, what they think is going on. Um, so we talked about Jenga a little bit earlier, and we talked about the ball game uh, where you put your hands on. So actually, this Jenga game um, is standard Jenga. We designed it as giant Jenga, but it's standard uh, Jenga rules. You can pull any, any block. The block you pull ha has a written question or action upon it. So um, a lot of them were taken straight from the, the, the ball game. The questions were straight from there. The idea being that everybody in the unit um, who, was, who was present would participate in the discussion so that you didn't pull, pull a, a block and then basically get asked, you know, what's, you know, to, to, to say something um, that you might not feel comfortable saying. Everybody was to participate um, who was present. Uh, what was really neat about the uh, about this game, though, was some of these were also actions, and so um, we did have some questions that said, "Please perform your best meadow walk as a group." Um, also, please, um, please recite the outdoor ethics code uh, or the outdoor code. I'm sorry. Uh, please recite the outdoor code uh, to the tune of Yankee Doodle. And so um, watching the kids try to do some of those things um, just was a lot of fun. And then um, we had a hunt for Bigfoot. Um, and so this was a photographic hunt. It's one of the things that I talked about at the beginning of this conversation where they said, you know, we, we sort of uh, tried to embrace the use of technology um, uh, to the extent that um, we, we said, you know, you can get a certain number of points for this. I can't remember, it might've only been five points. Um, but in order to get your, your, your full five points, you had to find Bigfoot. We had a stuffed Bigfoot hidden somewhere on, on campus, um, or on, uh, in our campground, uh, which was a large place that had been donated, uh, or, or we had been allowed to use, um, for a conservation project. And then here are some Bigfoot signs that you would see, um, and as you take a photograph of them and, um, like I say, if you could get the Bigfoot, you were then you, you could get the full points if you found all the signs. And um, kids came to me and said, Mr. Bethel, is that Bigfoot right there? And I would have to say, I'm not sure Bigfoot's so sneaky. I have to see him on film first. So take your picture, sir. So I think that that is the end of, of what I plan to talk about. Um, the games that we played as part of this. Again, there was so much more. Um, Dutch oven cookoffs with leave no trace meals and recipes, um, the weighing of trash, uh, just a whole bunch of, of things that you'll find in the uh, leader's guide, which I think has been posted to this.
And I leave it to okay. Paul or Matt. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everybody. There is so much material here. We've run a bit long here, so we're going to move right through the announcements pretty quickly here. Uh, don't forget the, the conference is coming up this fall. Um, more information is being posted all the time. The, um, the web page to check is right there on the, on the screen, or you can always go to Outdoor Ethics BSA, and there's a link to it right on the, um, on the homepage. We've got uh, just a couple, uh, three more uh, master educator courses coming up. So if you know people who uh, want to take a master educator course, uh, point them to these. Um, finally, if, if it, oftentimes, well, Paul is probably better to say this than I am, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Um, if you're looking for help with outdoor ethics and you don't know who it, who to go to on the program operations team here, uh, we've got an email address set up. So just send to that and uh, let us know which council you're in and we'll get somebody to help you. So we're there to help you. The program ops at outdoorethicsbsa.org. And uh, uh, make sure that if you have a problem <clears throat> with conservation, we do have a conservation side of this this committee and they are ready and willing to help you out with any conservation uh, efforts. Also, right. one thing before you do the reflection, if you're on Facebook and you're curious about information for the national um, conference, please join the group uh, for the 2022 Conservation and Outdoor Ethics Conference. Um, we do have a large group on there. We post information regularly about um, Leave No Trace and about, of course, the conference and, and uh, what stuff to look out for that. Close here with a, with a reflection. Uh, back from the Argentine. Uh, when dandelions have set the mark of May on Wisconsin pastures, it's time to listen for the final proof of spring. Sit down on a tussock, cock your ears at the sky, dial out the bedlam of meadowlarks and red wings, and soon you may hear it, the flight song of the upland plover just now back from the Argentine. So I don't know if you're aware of the, the plover he's talking about is a sandpiper bird, but this is one that doesn't live at the beach. It lives uh, on the prairie and it winters down in Argentina and Chile, down in that area. And it flies all the way back every spring. So it's one of the last ones back. So right now, I mean, right here, I'm in Maryland. I'm, I think for most of us, we're really starting to hear all the birds out now. This is a great time. Go outside, just stop and listen. Listen to all the different bird songs you can hear. Uh, describe their calls and, and see if you can use words or syllables to make uh, the sounds like the birds do. It's a great way to go out and do that and get in touch with what the bird sounds are and go back and do that in a couple of weeks later and just see what's different between the time you do it. So thank you. And that's what we've got. So now we've got some time for questions after we tell you that next week, uh, next week, next month is um, we're gonna talk about, okay, I'm a council outdoor ethics advocate. Well, what do I do now? So that's gonna be our topic for May. And uh, with that, I think we're open for questions. If you've got any questions, um, please be sure, put them in the chat if you would. And don't forget to send in your submissions. I can see that one right here because it, Get in your submission for the uh, for the song verse because you want to get those slides. Those slides actually look awesome. I'm impressed, Maria. So 